Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture, we're going to be talking all about RNA viruses, and RNA viruses are very important. Last, last chapter, we discussed all about the DNA viruses, and typically there are the seven viruses that we talked about, including things like herpes, uh, the pox viruses, we looked at hepatitis B, we looked at um, some of the other viruses in there, including adenoviruses and that. And those are all DNA viruses. Those are viruses that go to the nucleus. They have a potential of integrating into your DNA. They could cause cancer and other uh, forms of issues, long-term effects uh, because of that. But today we're going to focus in on the RNA viruses. Now, one of the unique things about RNA viruses is that they mostly stay in your cytoplasm. So they don't go to the nucleus, they don't cause any problems of integrating in. One exception to that are the lentiviral family or the ones that like HIV, or we're gonna talk about the um, leukemia virus, the T-cell leukemia virus, would actually is caused by a virus and that is due to the integration, but it's very similar to HIV and how it can make its own DNA and then integrate in. But for the most part, RNA will stay in the cytoplasm, basically give you a overall infection, and then eventually you clear the virus, your immune system clears it, and you don't have long-term side effects from it, or latency from the virus that you would with the DNA viruses. And like I said, the one exception is HIV and its family, but we'll talk about that as we go along. Now, today I'm not gonna go into the difference between a plus and a minus strand. But this is typically what happens when you talk about the two different types of strands, and it all depends on the type of RNA that it has. It either has a plus strand or a minus strand. Plus means that basically it's ready to go. It can make its own proteins. It can go through and essentially make it replicate its RNA and then build the virus right away without having to go through a number of different steps. The minus strand has to go through a couple other steps in order for everything to take place. It has to go through replication first before you can then make all your uh, different viruses and that I'm not going to get into a lot of that because again I think it just complicates the matter and I think what you mostly want to know is about the viruses themselves some of the diseases that you cause again these are going to be very common ones that we talk about today this includes things like influenza I'm going to talk about measles mumps and rubella rabies uh, hepatitis C we're also going to get into good old coronavirus, so again, talk a little bit about those, and then finally end up with HIV and a couple other ones down the line, like Rio and rotaviruses uh, and polio and some of these other ones. So there's a lot more RNA viruses than there are DNA viruses. Again, these tend to cause shorter-term effects than long-term effects with the DNA viruses. Obviously, there are some that can cause long-term effects in that. And again, we'll look at a, a number of different ones, but we'll, we'll take a look at all the different types of RNA viruses that are out there. Again, another thing about RNA viruses that just in general, most of them are single-stranded. There are a few double-stranded. We'll talk about that at the very end, just like we did with the DNA, the differences between double-stranded and single-stranded. But most of the time when you're talking about RNA, you're going to talk about a single-stranded virus uh, and how it's built. And so again, this just kind of gives you a good generalization of where it infects. You can see that the RNA viruses stay in the cytoplasm. They really don't go in the DNA or go into the nucleus because they're RNA built, not DNA built. DNA would go more likely into the nucleus, replicate there, and then uh, which could lead to more latency and long-term problems where RNA stays in the cytoplasm, does its business there, and leads to the infection in the cytoplasm. So that's what you're going to see there. So let's talk a little bit about the different viruses. What are we going to look at today? Well, first, like I mentioned, we're going to talk about the single-stranded RNA viruses, and this includes a lot of different ones, including envelope-segmented viruses, which includes influenza, envelope non-segmented viruses, which is measles, mumps, rubella, uh, coronavirus, uh, rabies, some of those other ones. We're going to talk about arboviruses, which are essentially those that are carried by arthropods. Uh, retroviruses are going to be viruses like HIV and then also, like I mentioned, the T-cell leukemia uh, virus. 
uh, or lymphotrophic virus. And then finally, the non-envelope viruses that are single strand, which include polio, hepatitis A, and the common cold. So you can see lots of variation in the RNA viruses that are out there. And then finally, we'll finish up with the double-stranded RNA virus, which includes the Rio and rotaviruses, which are typically found in infantile diarrhea. These are also the viruses that you hear about on cruise ships when people get the big breakout cases of massive GI, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting on the cruise ships because they do spread rather easily through contaminated food and, again, typically fecal-oral type of situation. We're going to finally talk about a little, just a short little segment about prions again. I know we mentioned that at the beginning of the semester when we talked in Chapter 6. We're going to talk a little bit about them again in this one. They are not a virus. They are, again, a protein product. They are a protein particle that basically causes disease and leads to death. And we'll talk about that. And that includes mad cow or carts of Jakob disease. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as well in this lecture today. So let's get going on the different viruses. I do have it broken down by the different viruses that you see here. So this is a rather long lecture. So if you need to take a break, please do and that stuff. But it is going to go through all the important ones that we need to discuss and that we see infections even here in the United States. Uh, with these viruses. Again, it is a diverse group of microbes and it is assigned to one of 12 families based on their envelope, their capsid, and their nature of their RNA genome. And again, typically that would be either single-stranded or if it has reverse transcriptase or again if it's enveloped or non-enveloped and then single-stranded versus double-stranded. And so again, a lot of different ones out there. You can see your favorite viruses here. Again, we're going to spend some time with influenza, which is an or orthomonyxovirus. And then we'll spend a lot of time looking at some of the different ones here, including the paramonyxoviruses, the rhabdoviruses, uh, the coronaviruses, uh, and some of the other ones. And then we'll look again at the retroviruses, which includes HIV. And then finally, the last couple of viruses that we'll look at include ones that cause polio, hepatitis A, and then the um, good old diarrheal viruses with the rota and rio viruses that we have there. Okay, so again, this just kind of gives you a list of where the pathogenic effects happen. Again, I'm not going to go through all these different things. You can look at them, but it kind of gives you an idea of where they infect, what diseases do they cause, and that. You can see most of the RNA viruses infect the respiratory system. There are a few that infect the gastrointestinal or the nervous system, but typically most of them are contained to the respiratory system because they infect the respiratory epithelia in the back of the throat and cause you an upper respiratory infection. Now influenza can get into the lungs and a lot of times you get secondary infections due to a bacterial pneumonia. But again, typically the virus itself will infect the upper respiratory system and that can lead to long-term effects where again you develop secondary infections like pneumonia or other uh, situations there. Now in the second group here of more, now you have more of the nervous system uh, and then cardiovascular and gastrointestinal. So again, when we start talking about the rotaviruses and noroviruses, those are diarrhea. Um, some of the other ones can cause, it's cause encephalitis. So again, those are going to be with the arboviruses. And then the HIV and AIDS are going to be more of the cardiovascular lymphatic system because, again, they attack the T cells of the of the your white blood cells. And so we're going to look at that and talk a little bit more about it. But you can kind of see a wide ver variety of different types of viruses affecting different areas. First couple, we're going to be, like I said, mentioning more about respiratory. And then some of the other ones do, again, nervous systems or cardiovascular or even can cause uh, GI problems as well in looking at that. So the first one we're going to look at is the orthomonyxovirus, which is influenza. This is an envelope, sing, uh, envelope and it's single-stranded uh, but segmented virus. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. There's really three varieties of influenza, but the one that's most important is influenza A that we'll talk about today and list some of the diseases that it does cause. Now, there are three distinct virus types, A, B, C, uh, A, B, and C, and then type A is the one that causes most infections. You can see some of the big breakout strands. You can kind of get an idea of where these things came from based on 
uh, where it's been isolated. And then the last number, whenever you look at any of these things, when they talk about viruses, so this last number here is the year that it was isolated in the lab. Just like COVID-19 doesn't mean it's the 19th strand of COVID. It actually just means 19 was when it was first isolated in 2019. And so that's where the 19 comes from. I know there's a lot of misinformation about COVID-19 and that this is the 19th strand. What the 19 actually means is 2019 when it was first isolated in the lab uh, and looking at that. Okay, so again, with influenza infection, the virus attaches to and multiplies in the cells of the respiratory tract, goes in there, and the segments of the RNA enter in the nucleus and then the or enter into the nucleus and finished viruses assemble and butt off the cell. And so in this case, these guys do go into the nucleus to actually replicate, and that is because they are a uh, a sense RNA which goes in to make the positive and negative strands uh, and you can kind of see how this goes in and again I'm not going to get into the positive and negative but you can kind of see how this works and goes in and causes a budding off the cell. What you're feeling when you get sick is your immune response to the virus itself as well as the cells that are infected that are slowly dying due to the blebbing of these cells that come or viruses that come off of the of the membrane itself in these cases there so that kind of gives you an idea of what's happening in those situations now the key to influenza is the glycoprotein spike so this is what you typically hear when we talk about uh influenza or flu is the h and n number so a lot of times we talk about h1 n1 or h2 n3 or h2 n9 that's basically what spikes do they have on there. And this changes every year because viruses like influenza can quickly mutate in a population and change very quickly. The virus wants to find as many hosts as possible and in order to survive and get from person to person, a lot of times it needs to change very quickly so that the immune system, uh, when it responds to a virus, uh, basically has to respond over and over again to a different virus so it changes very quickly and we'll talk about that in a minute but that's where the H&N come from these are the types of spikes that they have on the outside and remember the spikes are the keys to enter in and again the two spikes are hemagglutinin and the aramidase and the H&N &N, and that's how we describe it and again both go undergo genetic changes and event basically decrease the effectiveness of the immune response and this is one of the reasons why if you get your flu shot every year, why you have to go get a flu shot? Because you have this constant changing in the spikes that occurs year after year after year after year. And so that kind of gives you an idea of what that looks like. Now, influenza can go through a number of different changes, one being an antigenic drift, which is just changing your amino acid con composition. So the virus itself doesn't really change too much other than the amino acids that they produce, and they can produce different spikes that way. And that's the typical antigenic drift. Antigenic shift is when you start shifting the number of strands that are actually in the virus itself. This is the one we worry about more because this is when you go when you have multiple species that these viruses are in. And so this is where we worry about bird flu in some of these. You may have seen some of the stories where uh, they talk about bird flu and we need to watch these populations very carefully. We have to eliminate a number of chickens because they're carrying this flu virus. And the reason why they're so worried about it is that there's a potential of bird flu and human flu mixing together in another animal and creating a super bug that could get people really, really sick. And that's what we worry about. And that's that antigenic shift. So you can see here, this is what could possibly happen is where you have a bird flu and a human flu where it now mixes in a pig. And now you get this mixture of the two flu strains. And now you get this one with the new spike on it with the duck H spike. And now it can cause some severe human infections in that. And that's the reason why we worry about those things. Because again, our body wouldn't recognize that N very or that H spike very well because now it's a bird spike. And because of that, our body's immune system won't react and it could get a lot of people really, really sick. And so that's one of the things we worry about when we talk about this antigenic shift. This happens all the time, the antigenic drift. The antigenic shift is when we start to see new strains of flu coming out that can really wipe out populations, whether being sick or all overall with the number of deaths that we see associated with flu every year. And so that's going to be one of the things that we worry about with that. Now, again, when we talk about the strains, there are, again, A, B, and C. 
is the most virulent. And again, looking at those types of things, these go in and can do antigenic shift. And again, what we worry about with the A strains is that they do this antigenic shift with birds, they mix their RNAs, and now we get these super strains that can cause a lot of problems in, in both humans and a num number of other species. And so just kind of the rule of thumb when we look at A, B, and C, both A and B are very similar in what they look like and again, having the number of different segments of RNA as well as the spikes on there. C is a little bit different because it only has seven segments and it only has one of the spikes. It doesn't have both of the spikes and so it's a little bit different. Typically B, what's interesting about B is that it doesn't go through a drift or a shift and it stays primarily in humans. And so a lot of times what you'll see is that you'll get this outbreak of A a goes through the population, and then what we'll see is that there will be a second strain that goes around a little bit later, a lot of times in the springtime that people get, and that tends to be an influenza B where you don't get a lot of sickness, but you get some, you know, you don't get a lot of death, but you do get sickness with it. And then C only causes minor respiratory uh, disease, and it's probably not involved. It does go from one population to the other. You can see that is found in other animals as well. But C doesn't tend to be as infective as either A or B. And like I said, A is probably the one we worry about the most, especially because it can go through the drifts and shifts very easily and create new strains of virus or new strains of flu that we worry about in these situations. Now, again, with influenza A, this is a highly contagious respiratory illness causes seasonal pandemics every year, except last year because, again, a lot of people were not co-mingling. We were staying farther apart. We were wearing masks and a lot of those other things. And that's one of the reasons why the flu wasn't as bad this last winter as it could have what it normally is every year. Now, what happens is that it goes in and it does bind to ciliated cells of the respiratory mu mucosa. It causes rapid shedding of those cells, so you lose your cilia over a period of time. And this is what allows for bacterial cells to work their way down into your lungs and causing bacterial pneumonia. So it's really not the flu that gets you really, really sick. It's the secondary infections due to the loss of the cilia in your respiratory system that leads to these severe infections. And that's where we really worry about severe infections that go along with uh, bacterial pneumonia. And that's where most people die, where you see the death rates go up, is when you start to see a lot of bacterial pneumonia that is caused by the flu itself. And that's what happens there. And again, the, one, the people that are most uh, inclined to getting severe infections are immunocompromised, elderly, and young, young children to pneumonia. And that's why we worry about those. And that's why we want to vaccinate those populations to protect them so that they don't get sick from the flu itself. Now, again, for diagnosis, there are some rapid tests that you can do uh, in serological testing to see what strains you have and that stuff. And that can be done at any really local clinic or anything. Typically, there are some antiviral drugs, but the problem with these things is you have to time them just right. So it has to be right about the time of initial symptoms. If you wait too long to try and take any of these things like Tamiflu or Relenza, they don't work for you. So you got to really time it when you just suspect that you may have been involved, you know, you may have been in close contact with someone who has the flu. You start to feel the symptoms, that prodromal stage. And now that would be the opportune time to call the pharmacist and say, or the doctor and say, hey, I think I've got the flu. And they would prescribe these and it would help reduce the length of time that you get. It wouldn't prevent you from getting it at all, but at least it may prevent you from either having severe disease or the shortening of the time of the duration of the disease itself. And so that's one of those things that are there. And obviously with this one, vaccination is very important and again i can get on my soap soapbox and preach to you guys all day all night saying go get vaccinated i know a lot of people refuse to get vaccinated for the flu because they think the flu is caused by vaccination or i get sick when i get this and again that is your immune system reacting to the vaccine it is not the flu itself and so you may have a strong immune response to it because you may have had the flu or a close cousin of it uh, circulating in your system and that's why you have a severe reaction to it. Doesn't mean that you're going to die from it or anything else, but I do recommend, even though a lot of times the efficacy, so we always talk about efficacy like with COVID and I'll bring that up in a little while, 
A lot of times with flu, the efficacy is only between 20 and 50%. So that means that you only are protected 20 or 50%, 20 to 50% of the time. But with vaccines, just like with the COVID vaccines, it reduces your symptoms. It reduces how bad you're going to feel if you do get the flu virus. And so that is why we really encourage people to get vaccinated because it stops the spread. And we know this with COVID, when we talk about COVID and all these other things, we want to stop the spread. We don't want people to get sick from it. And again, if you get the flu, you can spread it at any time. This is one of those diseases that if you don't even know you have it, you could spread it to people very easily as an asymptomatic uh, host. Or when you're coming off of the disease, you're shedding the virus, you're getting rid of the disease and that uh, uh, covalent part of the, uh, you know, when you're... Um, coming down from the curve. In these cases, this is where you can actually spread the disease as well. So vaccines, like I said, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say get vaccinated for anything and everything. You can argue with me about that and the efficacy of those things, but I highly recommend uh, getting vaccinated for the flu every year and just a way to protect yourself and give your body another fighting uh, system to fight against the infection so you don't have to get sick and potentially could die from this it is one that kills anywhere from 20 to 70,000 people a year. And so we look at those numbers and they seem small compared to some of the COVID numbers we've seen, but that's still a lot of people. And you don't need to get the disease if you have a chance to get vaccinated. And even, even like I said, even if you do get flu after getting vaccinated and you still get the flu, what that vaccine is going to do is lessen the amount of the sickness that you could get. So it may prevent you from, or keep you from going to the hospital with the flu. You may be, uh, you know, uh, have a upper respiratory infection, may feel bad for a couple of days, but it's not gonna be as severe as someone who doesn't get vaccinated now ends up in the hospital and now could potentially die from uh, getting the flu itself. And so that's one of the things to consider anytime you think about a vaccine in these situations there. Now, one of the other, uh, or, uh, flu or flu viruses that we talked about was the swine flu. And so you may, if you followed politics and that stuff, they talked about it there and that stuff. But this was one of them that came about in 2009. And this happened in mid-May where, uh, again, 41 countries were affected. It was a combination of the swine flu virus, avian flu virus, and then the human H3N2 virus that got infected into pigs. So it was a big mixture. This is a big antigenic shift that happened. You get this new thing and you can see the whole development of the virus that came in. And that virus was called H1N1. It was recombinant in a new version that affected pigs in North America, but it couldn't infect humans. And then finally it infected with an avian-like flu. And then that recombination came in. And so just like what we're seeing now with the pandemic, the one difference between COVID and this H1N1 was H1N1 did not have the lethality that COVID did. Otherwise, we probably would have had this idea of a pandemic about 10 years ago. This was a pandemic. This did spread throughout the country, but luckily the symptoms were less severe and less death associated with it than what we saw with COVID. So we didn't see nearly the, the, the scary you know, shutdowns and everything else with the pandemic associated with H1N1 that we did see with COVID. And that's all due to the lethality of the virus itself. H1N1 was not nearly as lethal as, as some of the other viruses, especially COVID and some of the other ones that were out there, including the uh, pandemic that occurred in 1917 with the flu as well. Now, let's do a concept check. Okay, so the concept check, which of these happens in the case of antigenic shift in influenza A? Does it cause single mutations in hemagglutinin? Does it cause recombination of RNA segments between the bird and human strains? Does it change influenza A from A to B? Or is it both A and B? So what happens during antigenic shift? So remember, that's the big one. That's the one we worry about the most. So what, which one do you think it is? If you need some time, pause it here. Otherwise, I'm going to give you the answer. And that answer is B. That would be when you put the bird and the human strains together and you get this brand new strain that can be highly infective and one that we really worry about. So that's the one you wanna think of. So if you guess B, you got it right, congratulations. And so let's move on to the next types of viruses. So the next group of viruses are all the envelope, non-segmented, single-stranded RNA viruses. So these all have a capsid, or a capsid, capsid coat, remember, and then they have the 
the extra membrane around the outside along with the spikes. And this includes a number of the RNA uh, viruses that are out there, including COVID-19 and the coronaviruses, but also things like measles and mumps, rabies, rubella, and hepatitis C. So these are some of the different viruses we're going to be talking about in this segment here. Now, again, the first group is the paramonyxoviruses, and this causes parainfluenza and mumps. You have the morbilia virus, which causes the measles, and you have the pneumovirus, which causes RSV. And so if you've had little kids at home, you probably know all about good old RSV and that it can be a pretty severe infection, especially in very young infants. And so that's the one we worry about. All these guys have respiratory transmission, so they through, travel through the particles. A lot of times they have an envelope that has a glycoprotein and F spikes that in initiate a cell-to-cell -cell fusion. And you can see here in my diagram that it causes the cell-to-cell -cell fusion leading to these multinucleated giant cells. And you can see this here where this is one giant cell with multiple nuclei inside that cell due to the virus infecting these cells and causing them to um, basically come together as one giant cell in these situations here. Now, the first group is the parainfluenza virus. This is an infection by the paramonyxovirus. You can see it looking here. This is widespread as influenza, but it's more benign. So again, it causes upper respiratory systems. It's mostly seen in children. This is the very common one that causes croup. Uh, and again, the reason for this is due to bronchitis and the bronchopneumonia uh, and croup that can cause, and that is due to the buildup of the mucus in the respiratory system. And anytime we talk about small little respiratory systems and mucus, we worry about things where, again, it causes asphyxiation and can lead to death in infants. And so that's going to be the biggest thing. Again, typically there's no treatment available. There's no antibiotics or antivirals that are going to work on this. Typically supportive therapy, you know, respiration. A lot of times if people have asthma, they may go on a respiratory uh, breathing tube to kind of expand the, the respiratory and relax and uh, dilate or not dilate, but uh, yeah, I guess it would be, no, it wouldn't be dilate, but restrictive with the uh, respiratory. And so to open up the, the breathing, the bronchial tubes and help uh, with the breathing, especially in the young kids, because anytime you're talking about constriction and causing that constriction and with the mucus can lead to severe problems, including asphyxiation on the mucus and that, and that's what that croup is caused by. And so, you know, if you've had kids that have croup uh, and the loud, nasty cough that goes with it, it sounds horrible. And again, it's one of those things that are caused by these paramonyxoviruses there. Now, another, uh, another paramonyxovirus that uh, is caused is mumps, and this is, uh, causes uh, parotitis, which is basically the swelling of the parotid uh, glands that are in the, uh, in the sal salivary glands in the back of the throat right around this area. And what happens is that you get the swelling along with the swelling in the cheeks, and that's the typical chipmunk cheese you see with this uh, back, or with this virus that you have here. Again, humans are the only reservoir, and about 40% of the infections are subclinical, but lead to a long-term immunity. There's only about 300 cases per year now in the United States, and that is due to the vaccination of MMR, which again is a trivalent vaccine that again prevents these types of infections. Again, typically it's uncomplicated invasion of other organs and about 20, per, 20 to 30% of infected adult males can cause uh, ep the epididymis and testes to become infected where it causes swelling in those areas. It can lead to some sterility, but not often. Uh, but really what we do is just let the symptoms run their course uh, and give any symptomatic treatment that is necessary for that. A lot of times ibuprofen, and um, or Motrin to kind of lessen the symptoms and bring down the inflammation in those situations. But really there's not a whole lot that you do. And again, the best way is by prevention, by vaccinating and getting that vaccine for MMR in these cases there. Again, uh, another one is the measles, and this is caused by the Morvillo virus. This is the red measles or Rebola. It is different than the German measles, and we'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a little while. This is very contagious. This is probably the number one virus uh, or most contagious virus in the world because all you need is one virus to get you sick. And this is why we worry when, we, when you hear about those things that happen in airports and people going in that may have... Been, uh, tested positive for measles. 
you worry about it because those that haven't been vaccinated can easily pick this up. And so it's one of those things that you're like, oh, oh, if you've come in contact with someone with measles and you haven't been vaccinated yourself, you yourself will probably get the measles because, again, it's that infective. It doesn't take much to get you infected. And it's like, like I said, it's probably the most infectious of all viruses that are out there because all you need is one virus to get you sick. Again, humans are the only reservoir. There are less than 100 cases a year, but we do see outbreaks quite a bit. And typically where people get this is they go somewhere out of the out of the United States, go on vacation somewhere, they get the virus, and then they bring it back. And that's where these outbreaks happen. Where we see it most of the time, and this is the last major outbreak, was in 2015. And there may have been one since then. Um, but a lot of times we have these outbreaks and it happens in un, under vaccinated or non-vaccinated children. They get it and then they can pass it easily on to other children in daycare. And like I said, it's highly infectious. All you need is one particle and you can see this pick up and basically you get these outbreaks very, very quickly because you get it in these populations where they haven't vaccinated or kept up with the vaccination schedule. So now these kids get the virus, get sick, and then they can pass it on. Again, this is why we talk about herd immunity in that the fewer people that are not vaccinated, the less likely this virus can spread, the less outbreaks that you have. And so again, I can get off my high horse and talk about vaccines all day and that stuff. But like I said, the one way to eliminate these types of problems is getting people vaccinated who can be vaccinated in these situations here. Now, there are two forms of measles. Like I said, the first one is the Rebola, which has the red spots. Though those are the skin rash that you see. And the other thing that you're going to see is the copalic spots, which we'll mention in just a minute. And then the other one is the German measles, which is the three day uh, measles, which is caused by rubella. So that is the other one, the MMR, which is mumps or measles, mumps and rubella. And so those take care of all three of those. But the rubella causes what is called the German or the fast measles, the three day measles that you get. And then again, you get the skin rash, but you don't get the copelic spots. And so we'll see that. Again, there can be complications. We'll talk about that in a minute with both of them. Um, but typically, this is where it either goes to the brain or it can cause congenital effects from the mom passing it on to the baby in utero. And so we'll look at that as well. Now, again, typically the virus invades the mucosal lining of the respiratory tract. You get a sore throat, dry cough, headache, conjunctivitis, lymphoditis, and fever. You get these copelic spots, which are oral lesions. So typically what you'll see are these white spots along the inside, either on the gum or on the tissue on the inside of the mouth. Uh, and then you get the exanthem, which is the characteristic red rash that's associated with it, the macropapula on the skin and the eruption on the head progressing to the trunk and the extremities covering most of the body. And that's what you see here on this poor little infant who's got the measles. And that's what you see. And then eventually the rash will clear up and go away very quickly after the infection is done. Now, like I said, uh, with measles, one of the severe complications is this uh, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis where the virus actually gets to the brain. When it gets into the brain, it can cause inflammation and actually loss of neurons over time. It happens one in one million, in a case in one in one million infections. So it's a very small risk, but it is still there. It leads to the virus spreading into the brain and cell fusion destroying the neurons, and eventually it will lead to coma and death in months or years of the infected patient. And once it gets to the brain, there is no cure for this. And so this is another reason why, again, why would you take the risk and get yourself infected with measles? Even though most people will recover and have no long-term effects, there are some long-term effects in you know very minute cases of getting really, really sick. Why would you take that chance if you could get a vaccine to block it and not get this at all and not have to worry about this at all in your lifetime? And so that's another uh, you know, reason why you should get vaccinated for this infection. Okay, the, the next one is the pneumovirus or the respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. Now, again, many of you guys that have young kids have probably either experienced it or worried about this because it is a very common one that we see, especially in very young children. We worry about this, especially in daycares. So if you have kids in daycares, this is where you're going to worry about it a lot. Uh, um, getting getting the kids picking it up and spreading. Again, it's the prevalent cause of respiratory infection in children under six months and younger, and they can get serious disease. What it can do is cause bronchial swelling and lead to closing, closing 
of the, the bronchii and basically leading to um, suffocation in very, very young kids. Essentially what happens is it affects the epithelial nose and the eye portal for entry, then gets replicated in the nasal pharynx and works its way down the respiratory system. You do get fever, runny nose, uh, pharyngitis, uh, ear infections, and croup. Remember, croup is, again, the very loud coughing that goes along with it that's associated with the lungs closing and mucus buildup in the lungs. And anytime we talk about small lungs, again, that um, getting that mucus and other things uh, in there along with the constrictiveness of the bronchii, causing that to basically lead to um, again, very difficult in breathing and can lead to asphyxiation, which we never want to see, especially in young kids. It's always tough to see uh, babies struggling to breathe. You never want to have that situation and then that with that, and so that's going to be um, the big issue. Now, there are a couple of treatments, especially in those uh, severe cases, including Cygnus, which is uh, again a monoclonal antibody that blocks the attachment. And then uh, the Revivarin, uh, uh, which is inhaled and anti inhaled an antiviral drug, which again will help block the RSV from binding and causing uh, again severe infection. But again, getting these early is the key. So knowing that there may be an RSV breakout in a daycare and your child was exposed. This should put you on speed dial with your doctor to make sure that they're treated if they do come down with symptoms right away and not prolong because the longer you wait, the more severe it could cause these, uh, you know, obviously bad side effects that can occur in these situations there. Now, another virus that's associated with this group is rabies. This is an interesting one because it is a mammalian virus that has not only humans, but many, many uh, warm-blooded mammals uh, basically get the disease. This is called a rhabdovirus. It's found a, or uh, no, also known as a Lassa virus. It's an enveloped or bullet-shaped virus. So you can kind of see this here in the electromicrograph. This is a diagram of what it looks like. And then this is where you see the animals that typically harbor this virus. And so again, typically they're wild mammals that spread both wild and domestic animals through bites, scratches, and inhalation of droplets. So this is why we vaccinate our dogs and cats with the rabies vaccine, because if they do go outside and they get in close contact with a wild animal and they get scratched or bit by one of these, they are now protected from getting rabies themselves. And so we don't want to have to put down our dog or cat because they got bit by another animal. And that's why we want to make sure that they have the rabies vaccine on them. And we go in every year and get them vaccinated for that so that they don't have to worry about getting this type of infection. Now, humans can also get this. Again, typically, if you get bit or scratched or other puncture type of wounds from these different types of animals that we suspect that carry it, this includes skunks and bats here in Wisconsin um, that you want to make sure that you go seek metal, medical attention right away because, again, it can kill you if you don't uh, do anything about the virus. And it can be the slow uh, progressive death or progressive neurological uh, issue that can lead to death in people when you get this infection. Now, again, it enters through the bite. It grows at the trauma site for a week and then multiplies, and then it takes time to actually work its way through. The infection cycle is completed when it replicates in the salivary glands ready to spread to the next animal. So essentially what happens is you get a bite from another animal. It could be a wild, a wild animal or a domesticated that hasn't been vaccinated. The wound enters into the system. It goes into essentially the uh, immune system, the lymphatic system, and then it uses that to travel to the nervous system where it then goes and spreads to not only the spinal cord, but to the brain and leads to these uh, long-term infections. And so you have these different phases, just like what we talk about with the uh, stages of infection. You have the prodromal stage where you get fever, nausea, vomiting, headache, fatigue, and some pain and burning. Uh, at the site of the wound, and that's the initial infection. You get the furious phase, which again, now it's getting into the brain, which leads to agitation, disorientation, sometimes seizure, uh, twitching, and then hydrophobia, which is again, foaming at the mouth. So that's one of the classic symptoms that you see with people, either people or animals that have uh, the uh, virus itself is that foaming that occurs.
And essentially, as the virus progresses in the brain and causes more damage, you get to what is called the dumb phase, which leads to per, uh, paralysis, disorientation, and again, stuporous, can't think very well, can't see straight, those types of things, and then eventually leading to coma and then death, uh, which would be the last phase. And really, again, when it gets into the brain, there's not a lot that you can do. And so that's one of the reasons why early detection and early treatment of the wound is one of those things. And a lot of times when you do get bit by a wild animal, they want you to bring the animal in because they will do an autopsy on that animal to see if it actually did have rabies or not. And if, it, if they can't get that animal into the clinic, then they will put you on a rabies regimen anyways just to be safe. And so that's going to be the idea in doing that to make sure that you are safe uh, from getting, the ra getting rabies and causing this and potential lead to death in these situations there. Now, what are they looking for when they do the autopsy on the wild animal? They're looking for these negri bodies. And these are the black bodies that they see in the neurons and in the brain of the nervous tissue. And so if that wild animal or animal has that, then they know that animal was contagious with rabies. And so that's why we want you to do that. Again, the bite from the wild or stray animals demands assessment of the animal, meticulous wound care, and a specific treatment. Typically, it's a number of shots to the abdomen in that. Again, preventative therapy initiated if signs of rabies occur, and the earlier, the better. It is a slow progressive disease, but the earlier you treat for it, the better off you're gonna be. So if you do suspect yourself getting scratched or bit by a wild animal, it's better to be safe than sorry. You go into the doctor, go into the clinic, and make sure they start you on a rabies uh, treatment so that they can keep you monitored to make sure you're not developing any symptoms and you get better, not worse from this virus, and that's gonna be the key. Now the treatment, again, is passive and active post-exposure immunization. Again, there's a number of different vaccines. Again, six doses with two boosters, uh, and then that's gonna be the big thing so that it protects you, so not nearly as many shots as before, but that's one of those things. And then control with the virus itself. And so that's gonna be the big thing, vaccination of domestic animals to make sure animals are safe and protected, get elimination of strays and strict quarantine practices. You may even hear, you know, a lot of times I know a couple of years ago, we did have a warning about the bats here in Milwaukee that we had to worry about rabies being carried in the bats. And so that's one of the things that you wanna be aware of. We do have bats all around here. Bats are great. It doesn't mean let's get rid of all the bats and everything else. But you need to be aware if you do get bit or scratched by one, they may be a, pot a potential of carrying rabies. And if you don't get that animal, go get treated and make sure that you um, get treatment for rabies because you're more than likely been exposed in those situations there. And again, a lot of times what we'll do is try and put oral vaccine incorporated in bait for wild animals to prevent the uprising of rabies in these cases here. And so again, you can see how it travels, gets into the nervous system and eventually goes to the brain and the symptoms that you would see in, in the human. And again, uh, without the vaccine can lead to uh, death within, you know, within probably 30 days of infection with that, uh, with that infection there. Now, one of the things that movies have tried to do is say that there's these viruses out there that lead to zombieism. And probably the closest virus that I can think of that would lead to a disease like this would be rabies. And so a lot of times rabies is associated with a zombie-like type of disease. And so I think this is where movie magic has taken, uh, you know, that whole idea like World War Z and all these other ones, Night of the Living Dead, Walking Dead, I Am Legend, and talking about zombies eating brains. And I can see where they kind of come up with those types of things because, again, the idea of rabies itself, you have these different phases, you get agitation, you get stuporous, you know, you basically walk around and then you want to bite things. And so that's kind of the idea of the zombies. Again, the difference between that and you can see how to identify a zombie versus rabies is you look for these different types of things here versus the obviously with rabies themselves, the hypersalivation, the anxiety, the restlessness, muscle spasm and aggressive behavior. And that's going to be the big thing uh, with the rabies because they want to bite. The virus itself is making these animals want to bite and spread the virus out into other hosts. And so that's what you're going to see with that. I thought this was a good, funny little uh, impromptu slide to throw in there just so that you guys realize that a lot of the movie making comes from the idea of the rabies virus. And so you'll see the kind of the tying together of the two 
uh, in those situations there. Okay, let's do another concept check. And so which disease are active and passive immunization given to simultaneously? And so talked about this, remember active is again creating memory where passive is using antibodies to do that. So which one of these have we talked about so far where you get a couple, number of different shots, including an active uh, uh, vaccine as well as a passive antibody for? Again, pause it here if you want to think about it or go and look at the slides again real quick. Otherwise, we'll give you the answer here in just a second. You ready? It's rabies. So hopefully you got that. Remember, you get the number of shots for the treatment. Both uh, after the fact, one is going to make memory so that you're blocking the rabies virus from spreading. The other one's going to be passive to block the virus itself from going into the nervous system. And so that's going to be key using those antibodies there. And so that's why you get both of them in those situations to help control the virus once it's inside of you and then also prevent it from getting into the nervous system in the first place. Like I said, the sooner the better. Anytime when we're talking about this, the sooner the better, especially with rabies, if you get bit. Go, don't waste time, go to the doctor, go to the hospital and make sure you get that looked at because you wanna be safe rather than sorry in the situations there. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about coronavirus and I know there's a lot of information out there and you've probably been hit over the head a number of times, but I figured this is the right class to get the good information and not something you read on Facebook and or YouTube or somewhere else and this is where you're gonna learn about it. So the coronavirus has been around for eons. It's been there. This is not some new hot virus that has just suddenly come up and now causing all different problems. Typically, it's found in other animals. There's been a lot of different uh, coronaviruses that lead to a number of different infections, including some that cause respiratory distress, gastrointestinal distress, and even common colds. Why this one has been such a big problem, this COVID-19, was because of the death that's associated with it. Most of these other ones that we talk about with coronavirus never lead to death, and if it does, it's very few and far between. Unfortunately, this COVID-19 is the one that's caused a number of viruses. Now, again, we've seen more of these outbreaks and a lot of it has to do with a lot of these different types of situations. A lot of it has to do with these wet markets found in China where you have animals, live animals, right next to people. And if they're carrying a virus, it can easily transfer from one to the other. When you slaughter animals and you have their blood on your hands and you don't wash your hands right away and you have cuts and sores on your hands, easy to transfer. That's another place. Again, the other thing is, is we are moving into habitats. And again, this is because we're expanding populations. We move into habitats where you find these viruses where we haven't been before. So as more and more humans move closer to the jungles and other areas where these animals are, the more likelihood these viruses are gonna pass from the animals that they're normally harbored in and get passed to us. Now, I know there's a big rumor out there that they say that COVID-19 was developed in the lab. I've seen no evidence so far, even though there's been some high-ranking officials that have quote unquote credentials and CDC and everything else that say yes, this has come from a lab. Right now, I don't think that's the case. I mean, there could have been some manipulation and obviously you don't have all the information from China about where this virus comes from. But typically what we think is these viruses are normally harbored in bats. Like I said, people then wanna go out and get rid of all the bats, which was not, a, not the right thing to do because again, bats are very beneficial. They're necessary for a number of things and they're good mosquito control. And so when we look at some of the other viruses that are out there that can cause these things. One of the interesting things is that there's an intermediate host a number of times. You can see with some of these other viruses out there that were the intermediate host. And again, the one with COVID-19, we suspect that this pangolin is the intermediate host. Now, pangolin is very similar to an aardvark. It has scales on its body. It can roll up into a ball. It's found in China, uh, in the forests of China's, China area, uh, China, uh, China forest and that. And one of the things that it does is it hangs from trees and is actually highly sought after because of the scales. And so it could easily, as one of those animals that people buy for either trying to uh, domesticate or again, used because the scales are uh, one of those things that people seek after using them in medicines and other things could be one of the reasons why, again, we see those in those markets and getting picked up and being transferred to humans. Again, three of the most pathogenic infections we've seen with COVID, are with coronavirus, 
includes a SARS, which is called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This occurred in 2003. MERS, which was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012. And then obviously COVID-19, which is the coronavirus disease of 2019. Again, it's all about the when it was uh, discovered. It's not the 19th variation of this virus. It's actually when it was discovered or isolated in the lab. And so you have those. Now, what's interesting about SARS and MERS is those viruses do not spread if you're asymptomatic. Only when you had symptoms did you actually spread the disease. So why these guys, the SARS and MERS, did not break out into these huge pandemic infections was the reason why COVID-19 did, was that these two did not spread unless you had symptoms. And we could easily round up the people and isolate the people once they had symptoms and said, okay, you have the infection, you must go and isolate yourself. If you're really sick, go to the hospital and we'll isolate you there. With COVID-19, that's not the case. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, if you're asymptomatic, you could be spreading the virus to everyone outside of your circle that you don't know when you go to the grocery store or anywhere else. And that's one of the reasons why COVID-19 led to this large pandemic is because it could spread at any time. It's one of those things we talked about with the infection cycle that most viruses and most diseases you can spread at any time. COVID-19 is the classic example. Just like flu, you can spread it when you're asymptomatic, you can spread it when you're coming down from the disease, and then obviously when you're in the prodormal or acute phases, you can just spread the disease very, very quickly, and that's one of the issues there with COVID-19. Now, like I said, COVID-19 information, uh, the virus itself it was the coronavirus disease 19 or 2018. It's harbored in bats. And, probably, and possibly pangolins, which again are those cute little animals uh, because again, highly sought after for the meat and scales on them. They're most trafficked animal in the world and in the open markets of China could easily spread from live animal to human very quickly. And in the human transmission from an infected animal, meaning that it is a zoonosis. Now this is from 2020. Obviously, these numbers have changed since you were watching this video in April and probably further down the road that this is a much higher number in this case. And I know in the United States when I'm actually recording this and that stuff that these numbers are much higher and that we're now over 500,000 deaths in the United States. And I think we're close to about 20 million cases. In Wisconsin, we're about 6,000 deaths at the time of this recording. So again, this number will continue to change and hopefully we'll go down with the vaccination. And so that's gonna be the idea. And I should have updated these numbers for you guys. And there are websites where you can go and get the numbers right away if you just look, type into Google, say, what are the uh, numbers for COVID? And they come up with all the numbers for you and they actually track it very quickly for you and how that is. So how is COVID-19 spread? It's spread person to person through aerosol contact. It is not typically found on surfaces. That's one of the changes that they found is that, and I have that listed there, can spread in contact with infected surfaces or objects. That seems less likely now. They think what the CDC has found is that it doesn't tend to spread on surfaces as much, so you don't necessarily have to wipe everything down in that. It's probably be just be in close contact with someone uh, that is infected either asymptomatic or symptomatic with those types of exposures. Now again, these definitions are changing and the idea is again more than 15 or more consecutive minutes within six feet of someone with COVID-19 can lead to exposure or a close contact is someone who spends 15 minutes or more within six feet of someone that with COVID-19 over a 24 hour period. And so that's going to be the other definition that's used by the CDC. But again, if you're a family member taking care of someone who has it, you probably need to isolate yourself. Or if someone that you've been with and you've spent more than 15 minutes with has tested positive, you're more than likely also positive. And so that's the idea that they want you to go get tested. But now they're saying really go only get tested if you have symptoms. But assume that you are in quarantine for the next 10 days. And so that's going to be the idea until you get symptoms. And if you do get symptoms, then you get tested uh, for the virus. Now the symptoms to consider, again, uh, many people are asymptomatic. They say anywhere from 40 to 50% are asymptomatic. The mild to intermediate symptoms include fever, body ache, dry cough, fatigue, chills, headaches, sore throat, loss of appetite, and loss of taste and smell. This is probably the key one because most other viruses don't do this. And this is due to the inflammation of the nerve endings in your mouth and your nose, your taste buds in your nose where you lose that. 
Again, in severe cases, you get the high fever, severe cough, shortness of breath, which indicates pneumonia. Uh, and then the biggest thing can occur, obviously, leading to ventilation. Other symptoms include neurological symptoms, uh, inability to smell or taste, muscle weakness, tingling or numbness in the hands or feet, dizziness, confusion, delirium, seizures, and stroke, and then gastrointestinal symptoms such as loss of appetite, nausea, vomit, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain or discomfort can also be associated with that as well. So lots of symptoms, but like I said, you want to think about it. I like this here. This gives you the big difference between those things. A lot of people are getting allergies right now and may think that they're getting COVID, but if, again, compare it to some of the things, I think the biggest one is going to be the loss of taste and smell. Not everyone gets this, but if you do have that symptom, then it's more than likely you probably have COVID. So again, most of these other ones don't have that, but again, that's going to be the key when you talk about COVID-19 and do I have it or not, is that loss of taste and smell. Again, these are some of the recommendations, and obviously the biggest thing is washing your hands, avoid close contact with people that are sick, put distance. And this is changing in school-age kids to about three feet, and again, there's some play here or there. Uh, again, covering your nose and mouth with a mask when around others, and co uh, cover your cough and sneeze with a tissue. Really basic microbiology things that I've told you guys all semester play with this virus, because again, a virus spreads through aer aerosol droplets, that's how you're going to get it. Any way to reduce that, either, you know, if you don't have your mask on, you're outside, and if you cough or sneeze, don't cough and sneeze into someone's face. Turn to the side and do it into your arm or whatever. Um, again, not mingle with everybody. Now, it's a little bit different now if you've been with people that have been vaccinated. And again, there's some uh, issues there and that stuff as well. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you've been with people that are now fully vaccinated, been through either the two doses or the one dose of the Johnson & Johnson and haven't been sick and you've been through your 14 days after your second shot, you are pretty much good to go to mingle with those other people. And there's very low risk of getting the virus and spreading it to other people at that time. That doesn't mean, okay, I'm ripping off my mask and going and running into a bar and a party after I get vaccinated. Because again, there are people there that still can carry the virus. And even though you've been vaccinated, there's still a small percent, 95% effective, is not 100%, 5% chance that you could still get COVID. Now, the cool thing about the vaccine, if you are vaccinated, is that you're not going to develop the severe symptoms. You may get the mild symptoms where you may get a headache and fever and all those other things, but it will not, the, the disease will not get to the bad stage where, again, if you've been vaccinated, where you get the severe symptoms, going into the hospital and potentially dying from the disease. And that's why, again, even though we know it's 95%, that means 95% of the time you will not get sick. But there's still that 5% chance, but the 100% chance that you're not going to go to the hospital if you get vaccinated. So why wouldn't you get vaccinated? You're not going to get sick, or I'm sorry, you're not going to get sick and die from it. You could potentially get sick, very small possibility, 5% chance, okay? It doesn't mean you're not going to get sick at all. I can't guarantee you that and write you a guarantee, but a very small chance. But the best news is even if you do get sick, you're not going to get sick enough to go to the hospital, and that's going to be the key. You know, you get the cold, you get over it, and then you're done with it. And that's that's what we want to see. And the more that we eliminate the ability of people or the, the reason why people go to the hospital in the first place, the better off we're going to be. And so the better off this disease, we're going to get rid of this disease because the virus is not going to be able to have a host to hang on to. And that's going to be the key in those situations there. So again, a lot of you guys have questions about the vaccine. A lot of you are hesitant to take the vaccine. I've had the vaccine, I've had the Pfizer, I had my two shots, and now I'm fully vaccinated. I've been through my 14 days after it. I had very little side effects. I had a sore arm, the first one, and the second one, a lot of people are hesitant because they hear, oh, it's just awful. For me, I had very little side effects on the second one. I had a sore arm for a day, even less than the first one. Uh, I had a sore armpit for a day and a half, uh, easy to get over. I did have a little bit of a headache, but that was it. Some people, I, my neighbor got more symptoms and that stuff, but it was only a day. They got better, took some Advil, felt better the next day. You know, a couple other people may have been out for a day or two getting that second dose. But if you're afraid of getting the symptoms of a day, try getting COVID for a week, two weeks, going to the hospital. 
why would you put yourself through that? Just get the get the vaccine, get yourself for a day. You may be inconvenienced for a day, feel miserable for a day, but then you know you're protected. Again, that's one of the things. The other thing I've been seeing a lot of bad information about is these mRNAs. People are worried that they're going to get cancer or that it's going to change you into a superhuman or something like that. You guys know this already. You should know. You're biologists. You've been in microbiology. You're going into nursing. mRNA. Where does mRNA go? It leaves the nucleus and stays in the cytoplasm. When you get injected with mRNA, mRNA gets into the cell, but it stays in the cytoplasm. It does not go to the nucleus. It does not go in and transform your cells at all. There is no machinery with it to change that mRNA to cDNA to get integrated into your DNA. It doesn't work that way. Essentially, mRNA, the reason why it has to be cold is because it degrades pretty quickly. And so when it gets injected in your arm, it may last for maybe 6 to 12 hours, and that's about it. That's enough time to get into your cells for your cells to transcribe it. And again, go through transcription, translation, and then you get the protein that's made on those cells. And that's where the response happens. So this doesn't stay in your system forever. It gets eliminated very, very quickly. The reason why you need two booster shots with the mRNA is to make sure that you get enough of a response so that you're protected, and that's going to be key. But even if you did get only one shot of these things, they do say that it's even about 60 to 70% effective. And effective, remember, means that doesn't mean that you're not going to get sick. 95% effective means that 95 out of 100 chances, you're not going to get sick with the virus. You still have a 5% chance of getting the virus. The difference with this is with this these vaccines is that at 100%, it will be 100% guaranteed, even if you do get the virus and get sick from it, you're not going to go to the hospital and potentially die from it. Why wouldn't you take that chance? I would take it. Again, I'm not worried about the side effects. I'm not worried about what the mRNA is going to do. It only lasts in your system for maybe a day. Uh, if you are one of those that the mRNA stays in for a day, it doesn't transform your DNA. I'm really, you know, it appalls me when I see people on um, Facebook and other things where, again, they, they tell people it's going to change you. It's going to transform you. These are people that probably failed high school biology or don't remember high school biology. How many of you remember high school biology and knowing what mRNA does? So don't listen to that stuff on Facebook. Listen to me. Listen to respected people who know about these things and what these things do. You, you yourself know, already know what mRNA does. You should know and you should educate people and say it's not going to do anything to you because mRNA basically just stays in the ribosome. You make the protein and that's it. You make the protein and that's it, and that's all it's going to do. Johnson Johnson's a little bit different. That is the DNA one. So what that is, instead of RNA getting injected in, it's the DNA. The DNA encodes for the spike. In any of these situations, what they're doing is producing a spike protein for your body to recognize. And so that's what the vaccine does. The mRNA or the DNA gets into your cell, produces a spike, so that your immune system recognizes it. Your T cells and your B cells say, hey, look at that. we got to do something about it. It makes a response, and then now it says, okay, we've now made memory to it. So now the next time we see that same spike on good old coronavirus, COVID-19, I can attack it and get rid of it before it makes you sick. We talked about this. Why do you get vaccinated? Those are the things. So again, I want to see you guys. I'd love to see you all get vaccinated. And again, if I hopefully if I change the minds of just some of the people out there, that's good. Because again, you're, these are things that, yes, they're new technologies, but we've had new technologies before that work just fine and all those things. And again, I would say, you know, out of the hundreds of thousands and millions of people that now have been vaccinated, we've seen very few side effects. And so that's going to be the key. Nothing is 100 percent, you know, and that's and that's the key on these things. And that that's what I have to tell you. And 100 percent means 100 percent safe. Again, some people are going to get side effects. Some may get some severe side effects, but a very small portion, and that's going to happen with any vaccine that you could possibly take. And so, again, I would say if you've never had a problem with any other vaccine before in your life, you're probably not going to have any problem with this one as well. And a lot of times what people get allergic to when they do have allergic reactions is going to be to some of the things that are in the vaccine with it. And that's going to be some of the buffers that help maintain the mRNA in the super cold. And so again, that's gonna be some of the stuff that we find if you take, um, what is the laxative? I can't think of it uh, right at the moment. Um, uh, but that's the that's the stuff that's in it. 
And so I can't think of it right at the moment. It'll come to me when we're talking about something else, but that's it. The other thing, remember that with the mRNAs, you need two full doses to, full, to reach full effectiveness. And that full effectiveness is 14 days after your second shot. So even if you got that second shot, you're not ready yet to go out and go be free type of thing until that 14 days after. And again, even then, you still have that possibility of picking up the virus. So that's why I still encourage people, even if you're vaccinated, wear your mask. Good thing is if you know that other people have been vaccinated, you probably now don't have to wear a mask with those people because, again, the likelihood of getting the virus from any of those people is going to be very extremely low and the activity is more. More and more get vaccinated, get out there. And if you do have more questions about it, please ask. I'm happy to talk more about these vaccines. If you have any hesitancy or anything else and you just need some convincing, come talk to me and I'll be happy to tell you about it and what, what happens in those situations there. Okay? That's all I'm going to talk about with this. But if you do have more questions, let me know and I'll be happy to go through it with you uh, at a later time. Okay, some of the other viruses that are out there. So we've been on Corona for a while and I wanted to talk about it because it has been obviously in our lives for the last year and a half. Um, but now obviously, hopefully we're going down, not back up again and that stuff. And we can uh, hopefully remedy the situation and get a little bit back more to normal here in the next few months. Okay, so rubella. This is the third one of the MMR. Remember the MMR is measles, mumps, and rubella. Rubella causes the German measles. This is an endemic disease in parts of the world. Again, again, most cases reported in adolescents and young adults. It's transmitted through contact of respiratory secretions, and it's based on serological testing. Again, you do get a little bit of a rash with this one. It goes away pretty quickly. Where we see the most severe disease is going to be in young kids. And again, that's because the rubella can travel from mom to baby and cause some defects, including heart disease and microencephaly in the brain. And so this is one we worry about transmission across the placenta. And so when mom uh, gets exposed to rubella, again, they may ask you to get vaccinated with MMR to protect you so you don't pass this uh, virus on to your baby. And that's going to be the key. Again, and again, you want your baby to be healthy and you don't want to have some of these side effects that can occur from this virus that, that you can prevent with the vaccine in these situations here. Again, there's two clinical forms. There's a postnatal rubella, which leads to the rash and fever. Again, lasts for about three days and then goes away. And then congenital rubella, again, infection during the first trimester that leads to a lot of number, a number of different abnormalities, including cardiac abnormalities, ocular lesions, deafness, and can lead to mental and physical retardation in the child. And so again, this is spread through the placenta and through, uh, again, from mom to baby. And so that's where we want to avoid these types of things. Okay, next disease is hepatitis C. Again, this is caused by a flavovirus and it's acquired through blood contact, blood transfusions, and needle sharing by drug abusers. Again, infections uh, with varying characteristics, again, 75 to 80% will remain infected indefinitely. Uh, in those people and that's going to be one of the, the things is this virus once you do get infected stays with you the rest of your life for in most cases uh, you can get possible severe symptoms without permanent liver damage and then most common have chronic liver disease without overt symptoms and cancer liver cancer can result from chronic hcv infection so you can kind of see the course of illness with it so again about 80 percent will carry this disease you get acute infection in the liver 80% will go on to chronic inflammation of the liver, leading to other significant problems. You can get fibrosis of the liver, and then you can get cancer or cirrhosis with, of the liver as well in those situations. So it is one that can be pretty nasty to the liver. We talked about hepatitis B in the last lecture, and again, most cases aren't so severe, uh, but can lead to that, and there is a vaccine for it that we do vaccinate people for. Hepatitis C, we don't have a vaccine for. So that's one of those things that you need to kind of remember that there is no vaccine for and that it can spread. We've done a very, very good job with, again, um, being able to treat people with this and then also screen our blood supply for potential hepatitis C. So again, that's one of those things that we look at. 
uh, in that. But typically where people would get this is either through a uh, blood transfusion, but normally uh, the other place that we see this a lot where people will get this is through dirty needles at tattoo par par parlors. So make sure if you're one of those that likes to get tattoos, make sure you go to reputable places that do, you know, clean and change their needles and do a very good job with that because that's the other place that you see a high level of HCV, HCV infection. The other place that we do see a large uh, population that has HCV is actually in the baby boomer generation because this virus was first discovered in the late 1960s and we found it in the blood supply. And so people that got transfusions and other and other uh, issues back in the 1970s before we actually could figure out and, and screen for this were more susceptible to this. And so a number of baby boomers actually carry this infection. And it's a silent infection that's going on in their liver where it could cause severe problems later in life. So you do see those commercials. There are cures now. Again, they, they said, you know, in our lecture, no cures, but there are some uh, pretty expensive cures out there. Uh, but there are cures for HCV. And those are, again, uh, antiviral drugs that actually eliminate the virus itself. And so that's one of the things that we now do see with HCV is that there are cures uh, for this uh, different, uh, for this uh, hepatitis uh, virus here. Okay, so the next group of viruses we're going to talk about are the arboroviruses, which are arthropod-borne viruses. This includes things like West Nile. These are going to be your mosquito viruses. And so most of them we're going to talk about today are mosquito vector uh, viruses, things like West Nile or yellow fever or dengue or dengue fever, some of these other ones that are out there that cause uh, severe uh, encephalitis or hemorrhagic fever. So those are the ones that we're going to talk about here in these arboviruses. Again, typically with arboviruses, they're spread by arthropod vectors. Again, the most common one are going to be mosquitoes, but also ticks, flies, and gnats can spread these. There's over 400 different viruses that can spread by these arthropods, including toga viruses, flaviviruses, and bunya and rio viruses that can spread. Again, most are caused by viruses that lead to mild fevers. Some can cause severe encephalitis and light-threatening hemorrhagic fever in most of these cases. And so you can see here, abrovirus is all about the vector. And so whenever the vector is present, we need to be aware of these things, including West Nile. And so mosquitoes are typically the vector we worry about. This is where we're going to see this in the summer months, high infection rate in the summer months, and then decreases in the winter months when the mosquito is not out. And you can see a number of the different symptoms that can be caused by these different viruses that are out there. Now, again, it's all influenced by the vector. It's clustered in the tropics and sub, uh, subtropics, and many temperate zones have periodic epidemics. And you can see where a number of these viruses are. Abroviruses are, again, closely tied to the ecology of the vectors. And they show peak incidence when the arthropod is actively feeding and reproducing, which makes sense. And again, humans serve as the dead end accidental host that is the maintenance reservoir uh, for this. And again, could spread from one to the other through um, uh, subsequent bites of the mosquito. And again, the biggest thing with any of these is controlling the vector and you can control the disease. And so we'll talk about some of these different ones. Probably the most common one here in the United States is West Nile virus. We'll talk about that in a minute, but there are a few other ones that are out there that can cause, uh, again, infection, including the St. Louis encep uh, encephalitis and then uh, 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 chikuna, uh, chikunguna, uh, chikunaguna disease and dengue, uh, dengue uh, a virus itself and dengue fever uh, from these things. And these you can get from, again, the Caribbean due to the bites of mosquitoes. Now, again, uh, oh, didn't I talk about this already? Oh, yeah. The general arbovirus infections, again, may result in undifferentiated mild fever with no rash and no long-term side effects. Okay, the most prominent symptoms of a low grade is headache, mal malaysia, which is basically pain all over, joint stiffness and rash, and then in viral encephalitis, this is going to be in the most, most severe cases. Again, the brain meninges and spinal cord get involved, convulsions, tremor, paralysis, loss of coordination, memory deficits, change in speech, personality, coma, and again, may have some uh, permanent brain damage if you do survive. And you can see, again, the encephalitis on the uh, on the right side of the brain uh, with the orange color and that right here with the swelling of the brain. Now these are some of the uh, infections in the United States, includes the West Nile virus, 
which again transferred to humans by mosquitoes infected by birds uh, blood and again 80% infect, infected show no symptoms so probably most of us have been infected by this and never had one symptom whatsoever about 20% of those that do have symptoms I uh, have again a mild fever sometimes a rash a headache um, sometimes vomiting and this would happen in the summertime so you'd kind of uh, suspect that this is an odd time to have a flu-like symptoms and then less than one percent so you always hear someone dying from West Nile virus but it tends to be like one one out of you know thousands of people that actually get infected and it's about one percent that develop severe symptoms and that's where you get again the high fever encephalitis coma tremors and other things that are associated with it so it's a very low chance to getting severe symptoms. Now remember there's no vaccine for West Nile, uh, but it is one that is prevalent here in the United States. Some other ones include Colorado tick fever, which is spread by the tick-borne. This is the most common tick-borne viral fever in the United States. Eastern equine encephalitis and lacrosse encephalitis, again, where you see this where it can cause viral encephalitis, but very similar to the numbers that you see with West Nile. Very few people actually get symptoms, only about 20% gets any symptoms, and only 1% actually get uh, any severe symptoms with this. So probably most of us have been exposed to some of these, never had any symptoms whatsoever in our lifetimes. Um, it's only when either we get old or maybe we're immune compromised where we may get some more of these severe uh, symptoms in our lifetime. Again, some other ones includes the St. Louis encephalitis. I just showed you case numbers for the last 40 years and where it's prevalent. Again, typically more in the Midwestern, Southern Midwestern states uh, where you're going to see this uh, infection. The Chikunaguna virus, which again, the uh, infections in the Caribbean, where again, most were asymptomatic, only a few small population that had again, West Nile virus. Uh, and again, mortality very rare, you do recover from it. But again, prevention and controlling the virus is the big one. The other one that you probably heard of in the last uh, couple of years was the Zika virus. This was like the big virus a couple of years ago and then went away uh, after the summer. But, and I think this was like 2016 when this happened, maybe 2017, but again, very similar to the infection with either chikungunya or the dengue uh, viruses where again, you may get fever, headache, and muscle and joint pain. Um, but the problem is, is again, with moms that are pregnant because they can pass this virus and it can lead to what is called microencephaly. And so again, you see the normal size of the brain due to a small size and head development microencephaly that can actually occur with this virus. And again, that's why we worry again about pregnant moms. So if you're pregnant over the summer, you may want to take more protection and just use bug spray, long sleeves, log pants to avoid uh, getting bit by mosquitoes because this virus is still around and we don't talk about it anymore really, but it is still around and there are still people that do get symptoms from it. But again, the most severe symptoms are actually to unborn children uh, due to the virus being passed from pregnant moms to baby uh, in those situations. Okay, so that's the idea there. Now, some other hemorrhagic, some more uh, severe diseases include yellow fever and dengue fever. Yellow fever has been eliminated in the United States. However, you do still see it in South America and Africa. So if you do travel those areas, they may ask you to get vaccinated uh, for yellow fever. There is a vaccine for it. Uh, there's two, again, patterns of transmission with yellow fever, including humans and mosquitoes and forest monkeys and mosquitoes where you see it in South America. Again, some acute fever, headache, muscle pain, but it may lead to oral hemorrhage, nosebleed, vomiting, jaundice, and liver and kidney damage. And there is significant mortality associated with it in severe chronic disease. And so that's one of the things you wanna worry, worry about. It is endemic to those areas. So if you're traveling there, they may ask you, and again, you may have to show proof of vaccination before they let you into those areas that you get vaccinated by yellow fever before you go to those areas. Dengue fever, again, is another fl uh, flavivirus carried by the Anides mosquito. It's not in the U.S., but usually a mild infection, but it can cause dengue uh, hemorrhagic shock, sh shock syndrome, which is a break bone fever, uh, an extreme muscle and joint ache, and again, maybe uh, fatal in those severe cases where, again, and this is typically, again, in the Caribbean and Africa where we do see uh, dengue fever. Uh, and again, most cases mild 
or asymptomatic, whereas some can lead to severe disease and potentially death in those situations. Okay, let's talk a little bit about retroviruses now. And so what makes these different than all the other viruses that we're talking about today is the ability to go from RNA to DNA. And so these guys can integrate into your uh, genome. And that's one of the big differences that retroviruses have versus the other viruses that are out there that we talk about with the RNA. Remember I mentioned RNA typically stays in the cytoplasm, doesn't go into the nucleus. The only ones that really do are these wonderful retroviruses or lentiviruses like HIV uh, that can go in, make DNA, and then integrate into your host uh, genome. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. So HIV, which stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, was the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, which is AIDS, first emerged in the 1980s. And so that's when we first saw it, early 1980s, late 1970s, 19, early 80s. And what we were seeing was people coming down with a severe pneumonia caused by pneumocystis uh, geovii, which is normally a harmless, harmless fungus, a rare uh, vascular cancer called Carposi sarcoma, sudden weight loss, swollen lymph nodes, and general loss of immune function. And that's what we were seeing in these patients. And what they diagnosed them with is a severe lack of T cells, which led to these secondary infections that we saw here. Again, we think the first documented case of AIDS was actually in 1959 in Africa, but then again, spread over a long period of time to around the different parts of the world. And so again, uh, this is obviously old. Now we're to the 40th anniversary of uh, HIV. So this is taken 10 years ago. And again, you can see the number of cases and when the first reporting and who's living with HIV and how long they've been living with uh, HIV. And some of the people that have died, famous people that have died uh, from HIV in those cases and some of the numbers of people living with HIV. And again, the biggest number is going to be sub-Saharan uh, Africa, where the biggest numbers are within the infections uh, that occur. And again, typically this is bloodborne or mom to child. And so what, what's happening is mom has HIV and then passes it on to the child through the placenta. And so these child are born with HIV, and that's why you see the numbers so high in these areas there. Okay, so HIV is a retrovirus and it's found in the uh, genus called lentiviruses. It encodes reverse transcriptase, which makes it unique. That reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that can convert the RNA to DNA. And so it can go in once the RNA is in your cytoplasm, along with its little enzyme that it has, and make copies and make DNA copies, which allows the DNA to get integrated into the host. And that's going to lead to the further diseases that are associated with it. And it is the cause of the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It binds to the CD4 receptors that are found on your T cells and then also your macrophages. And so that's where you're going to see this. And again, due to the spikes of the GP41 and the GP120, bind to the CD4 receptor. And then this co-receptor, either CCR5 or CXCCR4 uh, that are found on the T cells. And so one of the interesting things is some of us out there have a mutation in one of our receptors. And so about 1% of the population does not have the CXCR4, or actually it may be the CCR5, I don't remember which one it is, but are lacking that receptor. And because of that, HIV cannot get into the cells. So that 1% of the population that has that mutation, I believe it is the CCR5, lacking that CCR5 are actually immune to HIV. So they cannot get the disease even if they are exposed to the virus because the virus doesn't have the right lock to bind into. Uh, remember the lock is the, the lock where the key or the spike the virus has the spike, but the lock isn't there, so there's no key, or I'm sorry, there's the key, but no lock to turn to get into the cell. And because of that, those people are protected. And so that's one of the interesting things is trying to block that receptor, and that may be one of the new ways to actually potentially block people from getting HIV uh, in the future. Again, with HIV-1 and HIV-2, there are two different forms, and again, very similar. Uh, there's also the T lymph lymphotrophic viruses 1 and 2, which leads to leukemia and lymphoma. And again, HIV can only infect host cells that have the required CD4 marker plus a co-receptor. And that co-receptor is either CCR5 in the, in the uh, T cells or the C CXCR4 that's found on the macrophage. I think I had that reversed. This is on the T cell. 
this is on the macrophage in those cases, and that's where you see those um, receptors. Now, transmission occurs by direct and specific routes, again, mainly either through sexual intercourse or transfer through blood or blood products. And so you can see where these things happen is, again, either exposure through needles, punctures that have exposed uh, blood, blood products on them, so accidental needle sticks in hospitals or IV drug users sharing needles. That's another place. Again, direct blood exposure, so splashing of blood into open wounds or sores, or again, uh, uh, sexual fluid that can again spread into lacerations and that that allow for infection to occur and so you can see that what happens and again babies can be infected before or during birth from breastfeeding or crossing the placenta from mom's blood in those cases. HIV does not survive long outside the body only about 30 minutes so if you do have a blood spill that's one of the things that can be easily cleaned up with bleach or a disinfectant and again the virus will be dead. Uh, within that amount of time. So again, not too worried about dried blood and those things and causing infections like hepatitis B. With HIV, that doesn't last very long outside the body. So you need pretty much a warm body for transfer for these things to actually occur in these situations. Now again, it was first notif nationally notifiable in 1984, uh, and it's the sixth most common cause of death in among the people aged 25 to 44 years in the United, Se United States. You can see where the numbers lie and where uh, who is most infected. Again, where we're seeing most of the new infections are in men, uh, again, through male-to-male -male or homosexual contact. In this case, heterosexual contact female is the next largest. And you can see the rates again among uh, uh, young adults and adolescents. And again, typically the higher the numbers are gonna be where you have larger populations. And so that's why you see the larger cities that have the larger outbreaks in these cases there. Again, IV drug abusers can be HIV carriers. And then in 2009, the number of infected individuals worldwide was estimated to be about 35 million with about 1.2 million in the United States. And that number has obviously gone up uh, in the last 10 years. Even though we don't talk about it that much, it is still a prevalent virus that is out there and still spreads today in these cases there. Now, what happens is the HIV enters through the mucous membrane or skin and travels to the mac or dendritic phagocytes uh, underneath the epithelium and multiplied and shed. The virus is then taken up and amplified by macrophages in the skin or lymphoid, uh, again, bone marrow and blood. It then attaches to the CD4 and co-receptor and fuses with the cell membrane. Again, then once it gets in the cell, that reverse transcriptase enzyme converts the RNA to uh, DNA. That DNA then gets integrated, and then that can integrate and now become latent. So it can either lead to a lytic infection, which means make new viruses right away, or it can be basically one that stays in the DNA for a number of years. And we see with most people that have HIV, that get HIV and they are HIV positive, basically they get the acute infection where they get some symptoms, and then the virus goes latent for a long period of time, anywhere from 10 to 20 years, and then you may see a outbreak of the disease later on in life uh, due to, again, reactivation of the virus. Again, this is a nice little slide here because not only does it show you uh, where the infection takes place and how it takes place, but you can see some of the treatments, these stops, are basically how some of the treatments actually work within blocking HIV. So there's no cure for HIV. However, there's been a vaccine you know, in the works for a number of years. There's still no cure or vaccine for HIV, but there are a number of very successful treatments that actually block uh, HIV and HIV transmission. And so those are some of the ideas here, including here's that CCR5, like I mentioned, that blocking the receptor, because again, in that 1% of people that don't have the receptor, they don't get HIV. So if you block that receptor, you don't allow the virus to get in. So that's one good um, mechanism that may work really, really well, especially um, maybe in the future blocking uh, even entry of the virus into the cell. You have infusion inhibitors that block it from infusing in. Again, nucleoside reverse transcriptase. So this is probably the most common one that you think of, the AZTs, the thymine um, analogs that go in and block uh, the uh, reversion or the transversion from uh, RNA to DNA and AZT does a very good job there and that's some of those there. 
integrase inhibitors, which again prevent integration into uh, the DNA itself, and so blocking uh, the latency. And then protease inhibitors, which block again the chopping up of a lot of the proteins that are made inside. And if you block the proteins, then you can't have a functional virus, and that's another thing that again these things. And so typically, when people that are HIV positive, what they're going to get is a number of different drugs that affect a number of different systems. So again, there are going to be multiple um, multiple drugs that are going to block multiple events that happen within the infection, and that's going to be important to blocking this infection and keeping it from uh, keeping low levels uh, and protecting people throughout the course of the rest of their life in these cases. Now with HIV infection and AIDS, there's the pathology tied to the two factors, the level of viruses and the T cell level in the blood. Again, this is going to be something where you're going to have, uh, when you look at the number of cells, you can see the purple line is the number of T cells and where we worry about, again, people getting sick with uh, secondary infections is when the T cell level gets below the 200 cells per micro microliter of blood. And then you can kind of see the different levels of either antibodies or other things in the in the blood. And you can see the latency of the virus where it hides out and that could be a variable number of years uh, in that person. So again, pathology is tied to the level of viruses. So again, obviously most people get more sick when their level of viruses go up. And so that's what you see with the green line there is again, more infection to more cells. And then the level of T cells in the blood. And so again, when you lose those T cells, that's going to allow you to develop more secondary infections. And so again, you're going to get some of these other infections there. Again, where you get, uh, again, during the course of the HIV infection, which lead to more, uh, more problems and more symptoms that are associated. And then, again, the secondary effects are going to be the destroying of the C, um, the T cells that have the CD4, which are the T helper uh, cells and leading to the full-blown uh, AIDS or AIDS progression in these infections there. Now, some of the signs and symptoms. Again, these are associated with the viral blood level and the level of T cells, but the initial infection is mononucleosis like symptoms that soon disappear. Then you have an asymptomatic phase from anywhere from two to five years. The average is 10. Again, that's that uh, latency of the virus hiding out in the in the, either the macrophages or the T cells and that. And then the last stage is going to be Again, the AIDS or the immune system destruction, and that's where you start to see the loss of the helper T cells, which then lead to a number of opportunistic infections and cancers due to the loss of surveillance of those T cells. And again, the stages of HIV you can see here, and again, I showed you the, the chart again, the infection with the virus, the appearance of the antibodies, the asymptomatic HIV, where again, it extends for an uh, extensive period of time. And then the symptoms of AIDS once you start getting the opportunistic infections, cancer, and loss of immune function. And that's when you reach a point where that T cell number goes below that 200 cells per microliter of blood. And um, again, the increase of, of opportunistic uh, symptoms in there. So diagnosis of HIV is tied to, again, basic uh, two levels of screening. You have the initial screening, which can be done by an antibody-based ELISA assay, where, again, you look for agglutination of proteins and looking for, again, antibodies in the serum or the antigen itself. And you can see that here, the antigen capture in this case, or looking for specific proteins within the blood uh, to, again, for antibodies to bind to that and looking for for those types of things that occur. There are also rapid results that may result in a few in false positives. And so typically when someone is tested, you may go through a number of tests to make sure that you are HIV positive and not a false positive or a false negative. Typically though, you'll get the two tests and if they both come out negative, you're negative for HIV. If you're positive, you'll do a second um, you know, assay, we're again looking for the different uh, strains of HIV. And if you do uh, test positive, then like, obviously you're positive, HIV positive, and put on a protocol uh, after that. If you're negative for both, you'll get a third test just to make sure that there aren't any uh, false negatives in this case. And again, looking for either a positive or negative in these situations. And so again, that's why we basically, even if you test negative, that you get tested again within three to six months later just to make sure that you don't have the virus a second time to rule out any uh, false negatives in those situations there. 
Now, with uh, the diagnosis of AIDS, again, it's made when a person meets this criteria that they're positive for HIV and they fulfill one of these criteria, either a uh, T4, T-CD, T-cell CD4 count of 200 cells or less, the CD4 counts fewer than 14% of all lymphocytes, or they have one of the uh, experienced COVID provided or CDC provided list of AIDS defining illnesses here. And just showing you, here's a list of the different diseases that are associated with AIDS. And again, I'm not gonna go through all these. You can stop and look at these if you're interested, but you can see a number of different types of infections that most people wouldn't get if they had a normal healthy immune system, but are very common for those that get this when they have HIV or another immune deficiency. Uh, associated with this. Now preventing an HIV uh, infection and AIDS, again there's no vaccine. We always uh, again being in monogamous uh, relationships or condoms and using universal precautions and whenever handling blood products, again wearing gloves, prevent needle sticks, capping needles, those types of things to prevent those uh, situations from occurring. Uh, and that there is no cure, but the therapies do slow down. Again, we talked about some of these different therapies that are out there, and it does uh, slow down and diminish the symptoms in these cases. And people have lived 30 to 40 years now being HIV positive on these um, different uh, therapies in that in these cases. So even though there's no cure, you can live a long, fruitful life even though you're HIV positive in these situations and so you can live very long uh, with these different treatments there and many people have lived a very long time with these different treatments and maintain a normal happy healthy life uh, with these treatments there. Okay so which of the following cells are a target of HIV infection? Are they dendritic cells, monocytes, helper T cells, or all of the above? Okay I'll give you a second to kind of think about that. And that, okay, here's the answer. It's all of the above. So all these cells have the CD4 receptor. Dendritic cells are the early cells that are under the skin that will pick up the virus and then they transfer it to the monocytes and the T helper cells later. Obviously the most important ones are gonna be the T helper cells that get eliminated later uh, in the stages, especially when we start talking about AIDS itself. Uh, but all three of these cells uh, do have that CD4 receptor and that co-receptor that allow for HIV to integrate into their cells and pass the virus along. So if you got that right, good job. Uh, and that, I think we have one or two more of these. Uh, and we're almost done. We're getting there. We're almost done. We got a few more viruses to talk about, but we're almost there. Okay, so another related cousin to HIV is the human T cell lymph uh, lymphotrophic viruses. These are guys that actually can cause leukemias. And so it's one of the rare RNA viruses that lead to a cancer or a cancer diagnosis. And the reason for this is very similar to what we see with the DNA viruses is because they can make DNA and then integrate into the nucleus of the, of the cell that they're infecting. And so that's why you see it. With leukemia, what that means is basically you have an infection of your white blood cells and it leads to this overabundance of white blood cells in your body. And that's what you're going to see with leukemia is that normal, healthy blood, you're only going to have about 1% to 2% of white blood cells in your blood at any time unless you have an infection. Leukemia, that goes out the window. Once you have this, you basically get this overabundance of white blood cells, especially the T cells in this situation. And then you know you have an issue where you get this overgrowth of cells. And anytime we talk about cancer, it's always an overgrowth of cells in those cases there. And again, they're all acquired rather than being inherited. You don't get this from a parent, you get this from a virus. And again, it's situated uh, with acute and other others that are chronic, and again, they first manifest with easy bruising or bleeding, paleness, fatigue, and recurrent minor infections. And then underlying pathologies include anemia, platelet deficiency, immune dysfunction, and it's brought about disturbed lymphocyte ratio and function. And again, you can see some of the symptoms of leukemia here that are associated with uh, uh, the cancer in your blood. And again, the two lymphotropic viruses include the lymphotrophic virus one and lymphotrophic virus two. Here's an example. Again, they're both lentiviruses that have the same type of thing like HIV. It's kind of a close cousin of HIV. Again, the big reason why they can get in and cause cancer is because they can take their RNA, convert it to DNA, and then integrate in. Most other RNA viruses don't have that equipment. They can't integrate. It's a quick localized infection or systemic infection in that case, and then goes away very quickly. 
these guys can hang around just like uh, our good old friends, the DNA viruses that we talked about in the last chapter. And so that's where you see that uh, in that in that in these cases here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the non-enveloped single-stranded RNA viruses, and this includes polio virus, hepatitis A, and the rhinoviruses. So again, some other fun viruses that are out there. We'll talk quickly about these guys, and we're almost done, I promise. And again, the first one in this group is the polio virus or poliomyelitis. This is basically an enteroviral uh, infection that, uh, of the spinal cord that can lead to neuromuscular paralysis. Again, it's a naked capsid that's resistant to acid, bile, and detergents and basically survives the stomach when ingested. So this actually passes through the fecal oral route. So you get this from contaminated water that is contaminated with human feces and you drink that water and you get sick or food that's been contaminated, that would be the other way. Again, this virus has been eliminated primarily through vaccination and taking the vaccine. Again, I don't think they really vaccinate very much anymore with polio uh, in the U.S., but around the world they still do because it can be endemic in certain parts of the world. And so that's where we do see this uh, virus itself. And so you do see where this infects. Again, this infection is uh, due to the fecal oral route. You drink contaminated water that has the virus in it. Uh, gets into the receptors of the muco mucosal cells of the oral pharynx and the intestine, multiply and shed into the throat and feces, and then some leak into the blood. And then most infections in this case are short-term and mild viremia, meaning you have some virus particles in you, but then quickly eliminated after that. The worst part is actually when it goes to the nervous system, which can lead to obviously neuromuscular problems. Again, some develop mild, uh, nonspecific symptoms of a headache, uh, fever, nausea, throat, and sore throat, and malaysia. And again, if viremia persists, it can spread to the spinal cord and brain. Can lead to uh, infection of the nervous tissue, but not destroyed. Can lead to muscle pain, spasm, meningeal inflammation, and vague hypersensitivities to some of the things that are out there, again, cold and heat and those types of things. Now, again, when you get invasion of the motor neurons, it causes flaccid paralysis, and that is really the endemic disease where, again, people get severe infection from polio in those cases. Basically, decades later, post-polio syndrome, the PPS, is a progressive muscle deterioration and occurs anywhere in 25 to 50% of patients that were infected with polio virus in childhood. And you can kind of see some of the numbers here. And again, some of the damage in the spinal cord and brain that is associated with this deterioration there. Now again, paralysis of muscles in the legs and abdomen, and again, the bladder can result. You can get bulbular poliomyelitis, which in rare cases requires mechanical respirators. This is an iron lung. This used to be more common way back when more kids got uh, got the infection as a, as as kids again uh, back early before the 1950s and 60s. So if you ask your parents and grandparents that were alive back then, they probably know a lot about polio and know about their friends and kids that actually got polio in this case um, where it can cause it. And then it can lead to some severe deformities of the trunk and limbs uh, along with muscle atrophy. Uh, in the spine, shoulder, knees, hips, uh, hips, knees, and feet in those cases. And there's a documented picture of that infection there. Now, probably one of the most famous people that had polio in their lifetime was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And during that time, obviously, there wasn't social media. So they were very good at hiding that he actually even had this infection because during that time, obviously, you wanted a strong president to represent you and not have disease. And so they made it look like he could uh, do every normal function. So like when he was giving speeches, he would stand. He would have braces that would keep him up in those things. But over time, he got that severe uh, um, muscle uh, paralysis and weakness and degeneration and eventually succumb, had succumbed to that type of infection. Again, um, in those situations with polio, it can be supportive for the pain and suffering. Again, it leads to respiratory uh, failure and physical therapy may be needed. But obviously with vaccination, uh, we've eliminated a lot of this disease. Back in the mid-20-teens, uh, we actually saw a polio-like uh, virus that were affecting children, and a lot of cases were happening out west. 
We still really haven't come along and figured out what that was, but it was very similar to what we see with polio. So it may have been a close cousin of polio. And again, maybe one of those things, but we haven't heard a number of cases recently, but there was that polio-like uh, uh, disease that was out there before. So that may, uh, you may run into some cases like that in the future. Um, but typically polio itself has pretty much been eliminated in the United States. It's other places in the world that's still where it's endemic and again worldwide eradication is being attempted to get uh, eliminated uh, of, this, of this virus itself. Now hepatitis A is another uh, one of these viruses in this group and again this is a very small virus in itself. It is much less uh, it may be not maybe as infectious, but it's not nearly as severe as the other two uh, hepatitis viruses that you see uh, in those families like B and C. Hepatitis A is, again, one that spread through the fecal oral transmission and multiplies in the small intestine and enters into the blood and carried to the liver. Typically, there's not a lot of symptoms. You may get nausea and vomiting associated with it, but typically you either get it through direct contact with a person food and beverages and cups and spoons that are shared. So a lot of times you see this, especially with young kids or teenagers that share uh, either water bottles or utensils and that, especially like in college dorms and those types of things, you may see that. Again, typically they're subclinical or vague. Sometimes you get flu-like symptoms. Very few, uh, seldom do you have jaundice and you don't have any long-term issues with the liver damage like you do with hepatitis B or C. And so that's gonna be the key there. Um, it does go to the liver, can cause some minor issues with the liver, uh, but typically nothing too severe. And that there is a vaccine for this if, if it does, if there are outbreaks of it, and so to eliminate the spread of this virus itself. Again, typically, if there are outbreaks, there is a vaccination uh, for inactivated and attenuated viral vaccines. And then some of those people that are going into endemic areas where it's found in the water, you may be given a immune uh, serum globulin uh, to give you passive immunity while, while you're spending time in those areas that are endemic in the world. But typically, again, not a very severe one, but it is another one that can cause some mild symptoms uh, when you're exposed to it. Okay, so is poliomyelitis generally acquired through sexual contact, insect vector, ingestion, or inhalation? What do you think? How do you get polio in this case? How is it spread? Give you a minute. Okay, the answer is ingestion. So hopefully you remember that fecal oral route with poliomyelitis. It's spread through contaminated water, through fe fecal contamination, human feces that had the virus gets into the water and then you drink that contaminated water and get sick from it. So that's how you spread polio in those cases. Now the last virus in this group is probably the most common one we deal with every year and that is the human rhinovirus. This is the one that causes the most common cause of colds uh, that we get every year. There are more than 110 serotypes associated with it and making a vaccine because of all the surface antigens found on these different viruses are nearly impossible. So making a vaccine for it is probably unlikely. However, you never say never and that a vaccine could be developed for the common cold maybe in the next five to 10 years, especially with this new mRNA technology. It may change the game uh, for even the common cold. Again, many strains are circulating at one time and so and are acquired from contaminated hands and fomites. And so one of the reasons why we saw the number of colds and flus go down this year is because we were washing our hands and we were wearing our mask and doing those things and preventing a lot of these infections. So again, you probably didn't get a cold in the last year because you weren't around people that had colds and flus. You wore your mask and you washed your hands and so you didn't get sick yourself. And so if that was the case, Congratulations, you figured out how transmission occurs with a lot of these different guys. It's by taking care and washing your hands and covering your, your face and covering your mouth and in your nose to prevent getting sick from these viruses. Again, it is sensitive. Uh, it does include symptoms like headache, chills, fatigue, sore throat, cough, nasal discharge. It's typically upper respiratory. Again, treating the symptoms and hand washing and care of handling nasal secretions is going to be the key anytime you have a cold. And this is a great little chart if you want to stop and take a picture of this slide. This is a great little chart to tell you the difference between a cold and a flu. And really the biggest thing is going to be uh, the fever. Uh, and then again, this tends to be more severe 
more systemic, whereas the cold's going to be limited to the upper head, upper respiratory, whereas flu is going to hit you all over and you're going to feel pretty pretty bad all over. And there's a big difference if you ever do get a cold versus a flu, and you're going to know the difference between them when you have it have the flu. And so, again, that's going to be the key, getting vaccinated to prevent getting the flu. Again, there's no vaccine for this, so this is very common, but doing the simple things we've been doing, washing our hands, wearing masks, that's going to obviously bring those the ability or the chance of getting these things down to very low, uh, and so you're not going to get many at all. Okay, the last two viruses we're going to talk about are going to be very, very quick. These are the double-stranded RNA viruses. They cause... Again, infantile diarrhea, that's where you're going to see this the most. Three common symptoms are going to be diarrhea, vomiting, and fever. And so those can lead to dehydration, which is always an issue, especially in little kids. So again, these are the non-enveloped, single or segmented, double-stranded RNA viruses, the Rio viruses. They're usually unusual double-stranded RNA. And the two are the Rio and rotaviruses, which lead to infantile diarrhea which leads to severe dehydration. And so that's where we worry about these. Again, both of these guys can cause either cold or oral fecal transmission uh, in these cases where you get, again, mortality and morbidity in infants due to the severe dehydration that's associated with these viruses in these cases. So again, with the Rio virus, it can cause an upper respiratory infection like a cold and then also diarrhea that goes along with that. And so that's what you see with there. And these are very common, the ones, same ones that you find on cruise ships that again, people will then have these massive outbreaks of diarrhea on cruise ships that you hear about where then everyone has to sit in their, um, in their cabin for three days, three to four days because they had a diarrhea outbreak. And so you probably in those situations can't leave your cabin anyways, because you're so sick and, and that and have constant diarrhea. So it's probably not a fun time to get any one of these viruses. So again, we'll leave it at there, but typically more problems in smaller kids due to the dehydration associated with it. Okay, last thing I promise and we're done uh, is the infectious protein particles, the prions. Again, these aren't viruses. They don't have the capsid or the nucleic acid. They just are proteins and these proteins go into the brain and lead to the in, in spongy form encephalopathies which lead to death in people that get them. Again, they're protonaceous infectious particles, highly resistant to chemicals and radiation and heat. Normal ways of sterilizing things will not get rid of these proteins, like I mentioned before when we talked about sterilization and disinfection. Normal ways that we do this in hospital will not get rid of these things, so we need to come up with better ways to do that. This leads to the spongy form encephalopathies in humans called creutzfeldt jakob disease or CJD and in animals, the uh, mad cow disease. And again, what it does is it leads to the plaques that develop inside the neural tissue, which basically makes it more spongy like uh, when these develop in these cases. Again, here are the properties and agents of the spongy form. Again, they're resistant. They lead, uh, they're not viruses. They're integrated, are no nucleic acid, they're proteins. Uh, they do not lead to an inflammatory reaction. They do not form antibodies. And then again, they are transmitted by close direct contact with infected tissues and secretions. Again, in humans, it's the creutzfeldt jakob disease or CJD that's found with uh, the normal PRP protein uh, converts into an abnormal uh, protein form. This begins, cannot be degraded in the brain develops into these large uh, plaques with inside the brain, leading to destruction of neural tissue and brain uh, severe brain damage and brain function. And again, it's only through direct or indirect contact with infected brain tissue or cerebral spinal fluid that can cause the passage of this. And so this is why it is a rare form, but it can happen. Uh, one of the most likely places that this can happen is with uh, chronic wasting disease in the deer and elk population. So if you're a hunter or know someone that hunts, this is why they test is so that if you eat tissue that is got an animal that is infected with this, you potentially could get this disease as well. So this is why you want to be very, very careful and, and eat it. And remember cooking and other methods will not kill this protein. This protein does not degrade by heat or chemicals. So just cooking the meat does not get rid of this as well as uh, other things that would happen like with a parasite or a virus or a bacteria where cooking it would eliminate these risks. 
cooking it does not and so you still can develop that even if you eat that tissue even after you cook it so that's why you want to be aware of those things Again, a variant of CJD became apparent in the late 1990s uh, from meat from a cattle with the bovine spongy form encephalopathy. Again, it's difficult to diagnose and requires examina examination of the biopsied brain or nervous tissue, so the patient has to die to actually diagnose it. Uh, but again, prevention relies on avoidance of any contact of contaminated tissue, and there's no treatment available. Basically, it's lessening the symptoms, but death is inevitable with this disease. And so that's one of the things, and you can see the difference between a healthy brain and an abnormal brain with the spongy form encephalopathy, where you start to get larger plaques and destruction of neural or brain tissue in these cases there. We made it. So I'm sorry for the long lecture, but again, I wanted to spend some time on coronavirus with you guys. I wanted to talk a little bit about flu and that. And again, some of the misconceptions that you may have heard of, I really wanted to talk about those things so that you guys are making good decisions for yourself. I'm not here to try and convince you one way or the other, but allow you to give you the information to allow you to think and make decisions for yourself. And that's why I really wanted to hit hard on those so that you guys can make the decisions for yourself you have the right information, not the stuff you're hearing on the internet or someone said or I heard someone say this, this is why you do it. So again, make sure, you know, take that information, think about it and process it. And then you guys can make your own informed decision about what you want to do uh, regarding vaccines and, and a number of other things that we talked about today. Okay, we talked about the number of different RNA viruses. Again, I'm not so worried that you know all the different types of viruses. We talked about a lot of different things today. Look at the review sheet, go through that and make sure that you understand what some of the questions I'm asking and why they're there. I basically kept it very general. I'm not going to ask very specific questions on the test, but I want to just make sure that you guys understand the basics of this virus. Big difference between RNA viruses and DNA. RNA stays in the cytoplasm. It does not go into the DNA so, or doesn't go into the nucleus like DNA does. The only exception was HIV and the uh, lymphotrophic viruses that we talked about. But again, today we talked about a number of different RNA viruses, including influenza, measles, mumps, rabies, coronavirus, hepatitis C, West Nile, yellow fever that are arthropod vector borne uh, viruses, HIV, which is the retrovirus, again, can convert. That one's different. That one can integrate into the DNA, and that's why you have long latency with those viruses. Talked about polio, hepatitis A, and uh, rhinoviruses. We talked about the Rio and rotaviruses. And then finally, the last thing we talked about was the infectious prions, the protein particles leading to spongy form encephalopathy. And so it's a lot of stuff today, I know. A lot of it was just for general information. So again, because a lot of these viruses we do get vaccinated for, I wanted to bring up that idea and why we do vaccinate for those things. And then two, some of the symptoms that you may see, because you'll probably see patients that do have these types of things. If you're working in hospitals, these are very common here in the United States. Most of these things are very common, again, unless they've been eliminated with vaccines. And so you may get rare cases, but again, just being aware of what you see out there. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching this video. I'm glad you hung in there. You may have taken a break, had a snack or something if you did, and that I need a, need a break and need a glass of water and that stuff for talking for almost two hours. But I'm glad you were paying attention, listening. Hopefully I gave you some good advice. If you do have any questions, let me know. Another good thing, this is the last video. You're done, guys. This is the last video of the class, so congratulations. You made it to the end. I appreciate you for all the, the whole semester hanging in there and watching the videos. Hopefully you got something out of them. That's why I do them is so that you guys can go back and listen uh, to whatever I have to say about these things and maybe learn something from them. That's that's the whole thing, getting, getting to know something that you didn't know before, and that's the whole point of the, these things. So I'll say goodbye for now, and thanks for watching. I enjoyed you throughout this semester. If you do have questions, let me know. Otherwise... Congratulations, you're to the end. All right, have a great time. See you later. Good luck, and I'll see you. See you whenever. Bye.